Good morning. Welcome to St. Dominic's as we celebrate the feast of St. Rose of Lima, whose um, feast day is on August 23rd, Tuesday. St. Rose is the patron saint of Paniquitarlac, Philippines, a Dominican tertiary. She has sacrificed. Please silence your cell phones so we do not have any destruction on the Mass. The celebrant and preacher for this Mass is Father Roberto. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. my brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Thank you very much. Welcome to all of you who are here present and those who are watching online uh, to this beautiful celebration of St. Rose of Lima, a very humble uh, saint from Lima, Peru, who never went to the Philippines and yet she's the secondary patroness of the Philippines, made so by Pope Clement. But uh, just a beautiful story of a life dedicated entirely to God, and so this is a celebration of her life, but also in many ways for many of you, a celebration of your Filipino culture that you continue to uh, hold close to your hearts in this country, apart from, uh, uh, distant from your homeland, and yet you bring this great love for your faith to us. And so a great gift that you offer to our parish and to our American culture. So let us ask God as we begin this Mass to help us like St. Rose of Lima to give ourselves entirely to him again and again. And that's what our Catholic faith is all about, to give ourselves to God and to receive the love and the blessings that God wishes to give us. And now we ask for pardon for our sins. Oh, 
Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us all of our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you set St. Rose of Lima on fire with your love, so that, secluded from the world in the austerity of a life of penance, she might give herself to you alone. Grant, we pray, that through her intercession we may tread the paths of life on earth and drink at the stream of your delights in heaven. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. The angel led me to the gate which faces the east, and there I saw the glory of the God of Israel coming from the east. I heard a sound like the roaring of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. The vision was like that which I had seen when he came to destroy the city and like that which I had seen by the river of Chibar. I fell prone as the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the way of the gate which faces the east. But Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the inner court. And I saw the temple was filled with the glory of the Lord. Then I heard someone speaking to me from the temple while the man stood beside me. The voice said to me, Son of man, 
This is where my throne shall be. This is where I will set the soles of my feet. Here I will dwell among the children of Israel forever. The word of the Lord. The glory of the Lord will dwell in our land. I will hear what God proclaims, the Lord, for he proclaims peace. Near indeed is his salvation to those who fear him, glory dwelling in our land. Kindness and truth shall meet, justice and peace shall kiss. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and justice shall look down from heaven. The Lord himself will give his benefits. Our land shall yield its increase. Justice shall walk before him and salvation along the way of his steps. My brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. And may the word of God always be on our minds, on our lips, and in our hearts. Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have taken their seat on the chair of Moses. Therefore, do and observe all things whatsoever they tell you, but do not follow their example. For they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to carry and lay them on people's shoulders, but they will not lift a finger to move them. All their works are performed to be seen. They widen their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels. They love places of honor at banquets, seats of honor in synagogues, greetings in marketplaces, and the salutation, Rabbi. As for you, do not be called Rabbi. You have but one teacher, and you are all brothers and sisters. Call no one on earth your father, You have but one Father in heaven. Do not be called Master. You have but one Master, the Christ. The greatest among you must be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The Gospel of the Lord. If you look at the Old Testament in the Bible, it is a process that takes place over a thousand years of God choosing his people from Abraham to uh, Moses and to the Israelites wandering in the desert. And then they enter into the promised land where they have to take away the land from the people who dwell there, who are pagans, Canaanites and Jebusites, and all those names you might remember from reading the Bible. And throughout this process of them being God's chosen people entering into this promised land, again and again, from Moses all the way through the judges and the other prophets and leaders of the people, 
God tells them again and again, you cannot be like those pagans. You have to separate yourselves from them. Do not take their practices upon, uh, uh, towards you or don't, don't practice their pagan religions. Be pure because they are unclean. Again and again, you see that kind of language. And even the, the rules of, that Moses gave to his people, the Ten Commandments and the other many commandments about how to maintain purity, how to separate yourselves from the impure world around you. Don't marry into the pagan tribes. Keep yourselves pure, separated to be God's chosen people. And it was a necessary stage all those thousand years for them to come to the identity of being God's chosen people, that God uh, loved them and, and that God was a unique God, not like the many gods of the pagans around them. So the religion that they practiced was in many ways a religion of separation and purity. And the image they had of God was that God was totally unapproachable. He was absolutely holy. And that was part of their need to maintain purity. It's especially evident in how they constructed their temples, beginning with Solomon in about the year 900 B.C., and then that temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. They came, when they came back from the Babylonian exile, they built another smaller temple. And then just before the time of Jesus, Herod the Great built the final third temple. The structure of the temples was there was a court for the Gentiles. That was the furthest away from what was called the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies held the Ten Commandments, held the, the manna and the desert and so on. It was the holiest place, the holiest things that represented God. And so furthest away was the court of the Gentiles. Then closer was the court of the Jews themselves. But none of the Jews could enter the Holy of Holies. That was a sacred place that not even all the priests, but only the high priest could enter, enter once a year. So again, you get this image that there was separation, separation between the Jews and the pagans, separation even among the Jews from anything or anyone who was unclean. And you see many of those laws, even the foods, the kosher foods, they had to make sure the foods were pure to separate themselves from being impure. And again, this was a, a necessary process for them to understand that God truly is holy, that they are called to be a special people. But then things changed when Jesus came. Jesus reached out to the impure people, to the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the sinners. He ate with them, which in that culture was a taboo. He spoke to Gentiles. He healed Gentile people as well as Jewish people. Again, he, he touched lepers. He made himself impure by reaching out to these people, by touching them, by bringing them God's love. He was showing them that now God wants to bring you into a whole different understanding of who you are and who he is. Yes, he's holy, but he's a God of love. Not just a God of holiness and purity, but a God of love. And so we see in today's gospel Jesus talking about some of the Jewish religious leaders, that they were still living an exaggerated form of that holiness, of that purity, of that separation. They were creating themselves as an elite, an elite group. We are holy because we're Pharisees. We're scribes. We know the law. We're not like you sinners. We're better than you. Again, that elite mentality of separation, but not a separation to give yourself more to God, but a separation to say, we're better than you. We're holy and you are not. And you see it again and again and again throughout the Gospels. Jesus struggles with them to show them that, no, 
you're not different. You're not any better than. In fact, as in today's gospel, he says, you're further away than some of the people you consider sinners and impure because God is a God of love. And love always brings you in contact with others. Not to separate yourselves apart from others, but to bring you to others, to bring God to them and his love to them. And that's a really different understanding of religion. Even to this day, I would say that our Jewish, the Orthodox, especially the Orthodox Jews, along with Muslims, still consider God absolutely other than us. And that's one reason they cannot believe that Jesus became a human being, that God became a human being. They just cannot imagine God lowering himself, that God is separate from us. But for us as Christians, Jesus takes away that separation. He is both human and divine. He brings people together in himself. He brings those two natures. In his ministry, he brings pagan and Jew together. He heals both. He brings sinners together with the holy. And if you remember the story of the crucifixion, the very, very powerful uh, symbolism that happens, I think it's in Matthew's gospel, where it says when Jesus dies on the cross, the veil in the temple that was from floor to ceiling that separated the rest of the temple from the Holy of Holies, that holiest place, the veil of the temple, what happened to it? It was torn completely open. So no longer is there separation between heaven and earth, between God and us, between holy and unholy, between sinners and others, pure and impure. And Paul says it so beautifully in his letter, letters. There's, now, there's no Jew and pagan. There's not slave and free, male or female. We're all one. Jesus has brought us together. So what does this mean for us? You and I can so often become like those Pharisees and those scribes because maybe we come to Mass more often, or because we do certain religious practices, which are all good, we can begin to focus so much on those external practices that we separate ourselves from those sinners who don't go to church very often, who don't practice their faith, who don't make novenas or have devotions the way that I do or that we do. This sense of us versus them it's part of our Catholic Church history. For 500 years, we Catholics condemned those Protestants. You as a Catholic could not go into a Protestant church because that was not holy. You had to get married in a Catholic church. And if you were a Protestant getting married in a Catholic church, you couldn't get married inside the church building. You had to get married in the sacristy or in the rectory because the Protestant made this union a little bit questionable. And Obviously, we condemned each other to hell. You know, they're going to hell, we're going to hell. And you see that in, in, in every religion, the Muslims fighting against each other. We've got the truth, you don't. It's a tendency that we have as God's people to, to use our religion as a weapon to say that we're better than you, and we're not. Now, so we have to fight that temptation of judging others, of criticizing others. Yes, on the one hand, we do have to be careful not to enter into things, activities, or places that are, might cause us to sin. We have to keep that sense of holiness and that God is with us and not to profane our religion. But it's meant for us to help us enter into the world more fully, to bring God's love to others in a deeper way. So finally, St. Rose of Lima. As you know, her life was really in many ways a life of separation. She separated herself from the time she was a young girl, said, I'm not going to get married. As beautiful as I am, my mom wants me to marry these handsome men and make money and, and have children. I'm separating myself for God. I'm giving myself totally to God. And even in her home, she lived in a little separate hermitage in her father's garden. Again, that sense of separation 
where she could pray. But her attitude was never an elitist attitude of I'm better, I'm holier than anybody else. She was very humble. She did all those penances that we have read about that are just amazing uh, to give to give herself that much more to God, to suffer in some way to bring God's love to others. And the telling fact that she was really not uh, separating herself from anybody, she worked and she helped her family, she reached out to others all the time. At her funeral, everybody came. The rich, the poor, the the military, the Spaniards, the indigenous, because they all were touched by her, drawn by her love. That is the ultimate sign of true religion. Not so much purity and holiness, not so much our external acts, but love. And Jesus says it again and again, but especially just the gospel, just a a recent gospel, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love is ultimately the sign of any, the, the true religion in any religion, whether it's Buddhism or Hinduism. If you are a person of love, God is there with you. You have God in your life. And love will never separate us from others in a sense of being better than others. It always brings us to others to bring God to them. That is true religion. That is God. That is who St. Rosa Lima was in her life. And that is who we are called to be in our lives. And now we stand and offer our prayers to the Lord this morning. For Pope Francis, that the Holy Spirit will continue to enlighten and embolden him as he embarks on a great undertaking, shepherding and renewing the flock. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That like St. Rose, we will invest our time and skills in those things that have deeper values and that will make us closer to God. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For an end to extreme weather conditions, and that God will send rain to those places that recently experienced drought and sunshine to those affected with heavy rains. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That our vision and prayer may enlighten those in position of power to seek justice through the equitable distribution of the world's goods and through peace among those who share them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all of us here present, that we may treat each other with respect and kindness, realizing that we are one big, united family in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all of us, that God will strengthen and guide us in our daily lives, recognizing him as our constant companion in times of trials and sufferings, and our assured hope in times of uncertainty. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the deceased, especially Father John Bagarding, OSB, Brother Peter Zo, OSV, Nene Domingo, Ines Obsena, Badi Pablo, Elizabeth Paragas, Silvia Recto, Estrelita Palaganas, Benjamin de Gracia Jr., Yvette Policarpio, Tony Aguinaldo, Jeffrey Palaganas, Rob Harutunian, Gustin Tuazon, Keith Johnson, and Tony Macaraig. 
May they know the peace and fullness of eternal life with God. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pause a few moments to pray for our own intentions in the silence of our hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Holy God, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for the great gift of St. Rose of Lima to our world, especially to the Philippines. And we ask you for the grace that we would truly be your people by showing our love for you and for others. We make our prayers through Christ our Lord. Please be seated. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that this our sacrifice and that we ourselves might be acceptable to our loving and almighty God. As we proclaim your wonders, O Lord, in the, bless, in the virgin blessed Rose of Lima, we humbly implore your majesty that as her merits are pleasing to you, so too our dutiful service may find favor in your sight through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, for in the saints who consecrated themselves to Christ for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, it is right to celebrate the wonders of your providence by which you call human nature back to its original holiness and bring it to experience on this earth the gifts you promise in the new world to come. And so with all the angels and saints, we praise you as without end we acclaim.
You are indeed holy and to be glorified, O God, who love the human race and who always walk with us on the journey of life. Blessed indeed is your Son present in our midst when we are gathered by his love and when, as once for the disciples, so now for us, he opens the scriptures and breaks the bread. Therefore, Father most merciful, we ask that you send forth your Holy Spirit to sanctify these gifts of bread and wine, that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, on the night of the Last Supper, he took bread and said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, gave you thanks, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. Therefore, Holy Father, as we celebrate the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Savior, whom you led through his passion and death on the cross to the glory of the resurrection, and whom you have seated at your right hand, we proclaim the work of your love until he comes again, and we offer you the bread of of life and the chalice of blessing. Look with favor on the oblation of your church in which we show forth the paschal sacrifice of Christ that has been handed on to us and grant that by the power of the spirit of your love we may be counted now and until the day of eternity among the members of your Son in whose body and blood we have communion. Bring your church, O Lord, to perfect faith and charity, together with Francis our Pope and Jose our Bishop, with all bishops, priests, and deacons, and the entire people you have made your own. Open our eyes to the needs of our brothers and sisters. Inspire in us words and actions to comfort those who labor and are burdened. Make us serve them truly after the example of Christ and at his command. And may your church stand as a living witness to truth and freedom, to peace and justice, that all people may be raised up to a new hope. Remember our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the peace of your Christ and all the dead whose faith you alone have known. Admit them to rejoice in the light of your face and in the resurrection Give them the fullness of life. Grant also to us, when our earthly pilgrimage is done, that we may come to an eternal dwelling place and live with you forever. There in communion with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, 
with the apostles and martyrs, with St. Rose of Lima and all the saints, we shall praise and exalt you through Jesus Christ, your Son. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Now stand once again and we pray together in the words that Jesus our Savior taught us. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Thank you. Now let us offer each other a sign of peace. My brothers and sisters, behold Jesus, the Lamb of God, 
who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. But I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. We'll say it together once again, the act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things. And I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there. And unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Renewed by partaking of this divine gift, we pray, O Lord our God, that by the example of the blessed Rose of Lima, bearing in our body the death of Jesus, we may strive to hold fast to you alone through Christ our Lord. I believe we have some announcements. The Saint Rose of Lima devotees wish to extend their profound thanks to the following. To Father Roberto Corral for officiating the Mass. To Ping Bayani and the Filipino Choir for the liturgical music. To those who, in one way or another, help make this year's Mass celebration possible. To all of you who took the time today to attend the Mass for the annual St. Rose Feast and those who joined us virtually. May God and the Blessed Mother, through the intercession of St. Rose, keep you and your families safe and healthy. Thank you. The Lord be with you. And with May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go in peace and like St. Rose, glorify God in our lives. <laughs>